I am Kanata, and I that is we. Villages of light that stretch from sea to sea to sea. A human constellation as long as the rivers run. Can it talk, can it chalk, can it ye? We are Canadian. A characteristic that follows from being in a constellation is that each point of light will appear to have different wavelengths, colors, and brightness depending on where and when we view it. Many observations and experiences are needed to understand what we belong to. What appear as contradictions are really paradoxes, both ands, not either ors. This is tolerance for ambiguity. We see this play out in three areas, in our institutions, in ambivalence toward our leaders, and in side-by-side -side coexistence of differing cultural and belief systems by large parts of our population. First, in our institutions, we're a federation, but one region has been a distinct society from the start, and others have carved out special powers for themselves or parked powers with the federation. We have parliamentary government with unwritten conventions and precedents, but two levels of government necessitates a written division of powers in our constitution. The division of powers and two types of common law, Anglo-Saxon and Code Civil, plus recognition of indigenous legal traditions requires courts and judges to referee. We've an entrenched charter of rights and freedoms, but rights can be overridden by a vote of the legislature, the notwithstanding clause, for a five-year renewable period. Second, we show ambivalence toward our leaders. We're not habitual hero-makers. When we put one on a pedestal, we later delight to pull them down. We voted our four longest-serving prime ministers out of office, three for one term to try an alternative before returning to the devil we knew. No provincial premier has ever become a successful federal prime minister. It seems that the very qualities that make a leader highly popular in one region count against them in another. Third, our post-contact Kanata, once it's spread beyond the St. Lawrence, has encompassed cultures and belief systems that, in other times and places, would be utterly opposed. Diversity and inclusion has 250-year-old Kanata roots, live and let live in the constellation as exceptions, not policies imposed on an entire population. Evolution is permissive, not a prescribed process. People would rather be invited than commandeered. For a century after 1838, the either-or question was a French-English one. Many Anglo business figures believed it was time to complete what was unfinished from the Plains of Abraham, a conquest softened by Britain's desire to hold Quebec's neutrality in the troubles with the Thirteen Colonies, and later materialized in partitioning Quebec into Lower and Upper Canadas. Many of these were Montreal merchants. Some had fled to Canada from the U.S. Revolution. Their voices prevailed on Lord Durham in his recommendation to rejoin the two Kanadas into one province to assimilate a pastoral Catholic collective, anti-commercial mindset impeding the free spirit of capitalism surging across the U.S. Later governors-general proved sympathetic to French Canadians, and as the Act of Union failed to achieve assimilation, the Montreal merchants showed their true loyalties in a petition for another union, annexation with the U.S. The integrity and equality of the French and English peoples in the United Province was upheld by the pragmatic duo of Robert Baldwin and Louis-Hippolyte Lafontaine. But frequent political deadlock between the groups and their representatives in the Assembly led to calls for restructuring. One proposal was for a federation of the two Canadas to restore the pre-1840 partition with a federal assembly, not just a governor, shared by both. But federations of two parts, like Czechoslovakia, have seldom proved sustainable. Another partner was needed. 
When Britain's maritime colonies met in Charlottetown to discuss union, a delegation from the Canadas showed up with a plan that was first draft of Confederation. Three regions, Maritime, Quebec and Ontario, later four with the West. The regional base set out in Section 22 in the Constitution Act 1867. Confederation was barely two years old when tensions between Quebec Catholics and Ontario Protestants broke out again. This time it was not over their own governance, but Rupert's Land, the former Hudson's Bay Company territory where Métis inhabitants in Red River, led by Louis Riel, had set up a provisional government to defend their land rights in the face of a handover of the region to Canada. English-speaking surveyors from Ontario had been driving markers on strip farms where Métis had squatted, built homes and raised families for generations. This was a legitimate grievance. Riel's was a legitimate government, elected by the inhabitants, approved by the last Hudson's Bay Company governor, and pledging loyalty to Queen Victoria, recognized by both the outgoing Hudson's Bay administration and the incoming Dominion of Canada one. Hearing of the unrest, the Canadian government delayed its takeover, creating a power vacuum. Though the situation in Red River was unique, it triggered eastern sectional loyalties. Quebecers identified with Riel because he was French-speaking and Catholic. Ontario Protestant members of the Loyal Orange Order, an anti-Catholic transplant from Northern Ireland, were enraged by the provisional government's execution of Thomas Scott, an Orangeman who had uttered death threats against Riel and was part of an English-speaking coup to bring down his government. The Red River Uprising forced John A. MacDonald into one of his most difficult pieces of doublespeak. He granted Métis demands of provincial status for Manitoba, appeasing Quebec voters who supported Riel, but he did not admit to dealing with Riel at the cost of his support in Ontario. Having placated the Métis in Quebec by creating a bilingual Manitoba, MacDonald sent out a military expedition to march west and provide a Canadian presence in the new province in which the U.S. was now showing interest. But he was unable to raise Quebec recruits to balance Orange volunteers he feared might lynch Riel. So he bribed the Métis leader to flee to the U.S., then appeared in Parliament saying, Where is Riel? I wish to God I could lay hands on him. MacDonald has been criticized for his failure to have consulted with the inhabitants of Red River beforehand. He is not above reproach here, but there was a reason for his reluctance to create a new province until the Métis forced his hand. Confederation emerged in the shadow of the U.S. Civil War, and its fathers were anxious to avoid the mistakes of their neighbor to the south. A wave of new states was created in the lead-up to hostilities in the U.S., as slave and free states raced to increase their clout. MacDonald did not wish the Canadian West to develop in this way. He wanted the West as a counterweight to Ontario-Quebec tensions, not as a transplant of them. After MacDonald, that tension surfaced in conscription crises of the two world wars. In the First War, a so-called Union government split Laurier's Liberal Party, bringing pro-conscriptionists of two parties together to impose enforced enlistment on Quebec. In World War II, opposition leader and former Prime Minister Arthur Meehan called for French and English blood to be spilled equally. Meehan had been Attorney General who brought in the bill for conscription in World War I. This time he faced Prime Minister Mackenzie King, who was resolved Quebec should never again be isolated. Faced with pressure from an Anglophone majority to go back on the Pledge of No Conscription as war casualties mounted, King resorted to a referendum to blunt the question. Its wording of conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription, left implementation in his hands. King pulled this off skillfully. First, French-speaking conscripts were used for homeland security. When troops in Europe required reinforcing, he ensured that Quebec draftees sent overseas were assigned duties on Canadian forces bases in Britain and not sent into combat. 
King's avoidance of a clear-cut yes-no prevented a split 45 years before the first Quebec sovereignty referendum. Each time we take a course of action based on a simple majority yes-no, the result is a disaster. Conscription, the national energy and other policies that kept less populous regions in thrall to the centre. A constellation cannot be run this way. Our integrity is achieved by consensus and balance as shown by King, the Fathers of Confederation, and earlier First Nations confederacies. Until the 1960s, friction between French and English-speaking Canadians reflected the Catholic-Protestant schism that fed centuries of war in Europe. Our greatest achievement in the last 250 years' interaction may be the growing live-and-let-live relationship between these two streams. With a numerical parity of Catholics and Protestants for a century, this is remarkable indeed. In the 25 years of the United Province, political deadlock between the former Canada's lower and upper Catholic and Protestant was behind most non-economic issues. This was intensified by the fact that most social services then, health, education, poverty relief, seniors' care and immigrant settlement, were faith-based. Surmounting this hurdle required a double majority, French, English, Catholic, Protestant, for measures to pass the Assembly supported by grants of public land and to build alliances between groups on projects that did not touch these issues. The time it took for double approval eventually led to the decision to restore separate levels of jurisdiction. One handled defence and economy, two of the three areas that had made up the New France administration, the other, local, now provincial affairs, where a consensus, if not a majority, would exist one way or the other, dispensing with endless bargaining for them to pass. This, with the addition of other regions, the Atlantic, West, and in time the North, was the basis of Confederation. The 25-year United Province showed how not to run a sustainable Kanata constellation. It confirmed that a tolerance for ambiguity was the way to go forward. At approximate parity with Ontario 200 years ago, Quebec has been the second most populous province since Confederation. Home to most of our French-speaking population, its effect goes far beyond its territory or population. To Quebec, the rest of us owe federalism, the historic concessions to its language and culture are the basis for other provinces' claims of sovereignty. Our affirmative action began in alternating French and English-speaking candidates for office. The ambiguities of parliamentary government and federalism, common law and code civil, activist federal government with provincial opting out, collective and individual rights in our charter came from a Catholic Quebec culture that became the most secular in Canada. All this began in the 1774 Quebec Act based on the middle ground of Elizabeth I's Act of Toleration. Of our 24 Prime Ministers, 10 have been Roman Catholic, collectively serving 74 years of the 156th since Confederation. The first, John Thompson, was the second to succeed MacDonald after he died, and was passed over the first time due to anti-Catholic feeling by Ontario Conservatives. When Sir John's coalition came unraveled after four short-term successors, Liberal Wilfrid Laurier won a mandate, but only after he made it clear he'd not be following his church's call to impose Catholic schools on Manitoba. This was a precedent for eight Roman Catholic successors in a country where Roman Catholicism is the largest denomination, 30 of the 53 percent who identify as Christian. Only two U.S. presidents have been Roman Catholic, John F. Kennedy and Joe Biden. Britain has had only one Roman Catholic Prime Minister, Tony Blair. I believe in a simulation of many aspects of Roman Catholic culture, including collectivism and the social conscience of many Catholic orders, but without enforcement of Catholic dogma in personal matters, are a Kanata trait of significance. 
Some of you may wonder why I'm giving time and attention to matters of religion in a secular society where even the religious accept the separation of church and state. There are three reasons. First, historic. Britain's recognition of the Roman Catholic Church in Canada and nowhere else in its empire affected how we evolved and what we became. Had the British been here first, they'd have had no reason to make such a deal. They'd have dealt with First Nations as they chose and given preeminence to British religion and culture for settlers who came after. But because they weren't first and dealing with another settler people who had had relations with First Nations at a time of unrest, they had to deal with their predecessors as a nation, in fact, if not in name. This created a composite culture unique in the New World. Spain's colonies were Catholic. The 13 colonies had Protestant values regardless of where their settlers had come from. Canada had a blend of both. This enhanced First Nations. Having recognized the French as a nation, Britain could not refuse this to those with whom she'd entered treaties beginning 11 years earlier. The post-contact pluralistic foundations of Canada go back to this. Second, current relations between Muslim and other Canadians are less factious Second, current relations between Muslim and other Canadians are less factious than those between Orangemen and Ultramontane Catholics 150 years ago. Those extreme factions of Christianity had less in common than the members of the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, who are reaching out and endeavoring to listen and learn from each other now. Building of North America's first mosque began a hundred years ago in Edmonton, led by Hilwi Hamden and other women from Lebanon who had come to join husbands working in the northern fur trade. Intended as a cultural and spiritual center for their children, it was funded by Islamic, Christian, and Jewish businesses Hamden and her friends approached working their way up and down along Jasper Avenue. The city of Edmonton donated the land. At the mosque's opening in 1931, members of all three faiths gathered to hear an international Quranic scholar and marveled at how well they got along together. Embracing diversity before multiculturalism was part of our vocabulary. Today, the original Al-Rashid Mosque building sits in a recreation of Fort Edmonton beside the North Saskatchewan River. Third, religion has not disappeared. It's simply taking new forms. Secular political movements have all the trappings and rituals of early cultic ones. A political hand described Greta Thunberg as an atheist Joan of Arc. Eco-activism is evangelical believers saving the planet from Armageddon. Kanata's ability to accommodate ambiguity has served us well. When fathers and mothers of Confederation admitted a united province experiment had failed and turned matters of culture, education, health, agriculture, municipalities and resources over to the regions where these policies would impact, they did not create special categories of blasphemy, ecotreism or thought crimes for which they could wade in and overrule the regions in a national emergency. In reply to those with one-size-fits-all solutions, we can say, Wait a minute. What have you to show that your prescription is right for truckers and academics, First Nations and newcomers, families and singles, cities and agriculture? Haven't you bitten off more than you can chew? This has been the longest of our Kanata trait discussion so far. With ambiguity as a topic and hard to compress, that should be no surprise. As we navigate the labyrinth, as the peoples of Kanata have done in the last few centuries, and alternate between poles, we'll find we're not only able to live and let live, but may develop a mental ambidexterity to draw on the best of both. Till we get there, let us be patient and kind with each other, and wary of attempts to corral us into simple either-or questions that turn into traps we don't see till they're sprung on us. Such unthinking certainty is not what we in Canada have been at our best or are capable of becoming. For Canada Connections and Consciousness, I'm David Watt. Oh,
village lumineux pour la des frontières a human constellation as long as the rivers run Canada 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 we are Canadian